The next train to arrive on platform one goes to... Float out across the street round 8.15, stemming from the house of sticks nestled safely under wing. 42 seconds of silence in about 11.5 country miles stood between us, decay, and disarray. And in that 43rd second rose a collective dawn, rain, and morning for yesterday. And through that very same decay and disarray, you could hear the souls of 148,000 screaming sacrilege and prayers. For anything from this world, the one above or below that would take them back as far as possible, as possible even, even for the one last, last week. week. I mean, the way that that is constructed and said, you clearly put a lot of thought into your lyrics. There's a there's a commanding attitude to an assertive Australian accent in a spoken word piece. You or you have to be authoritative, or you're going to sound funny. So there's only one option, you know. Authoritative, or there has to be something very uncomfortable about it. Yeah. It lays in a ditch on the side of a road you and I drove along once, and it was happy to lie there daydreaming. It stretched into the distance further than you ever thought possible, and it didn't give a fuck about you and I either way. Had him on the ball hands. I'm struck by her beauty. I She's know I smell like petrol. And so do all their radars. <laughs> Kill him as he sleeps. The question is that the motion be agreed to. I call the Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. I rise to oppose the motion moved by the Leader of the Opposition. I say with the Leader of the Opposition, I will not be lectured about sexism. We'll be looking at which vowel sounds and which consonants are used in Australia. Though. So don't say moi, right. It's more like right, 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 sign, lie. My name is Maximus Decimus Meridius. Father to a murdered son, husband to a murdered wife. You wake up one morning and you realise it's every other asshole in the world that's got it fucked up and you're the one that's got it right. I tell you what, any boss who sacks anyone for not turning up the day is a bum. <laughs> quite funny. I was, I was in bed sleeping at uh, 2 o'clock this morning. My wife comes in and says, oh, the shop's been, uh, someone ran into the shop. And I said, oh, what? But, mate, all I had was me jocks on. I, I was chasing him up the street and I'm just like, mate, 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 mate. End bracket. Uh, everyone else that's been on recently has been people I don't really know, and I know you a little bit, which is which is nice. Well, let's say we've done it before. You know? uh, yeah, Feels yeah. Like so, welcome to the podcast again. Yeah, James Dunlop, the thank band. You. Thank Light you so much. For it's a wonderful me. thing. Well, it's there's a pleasure, pleasure to be to be asked back. <laughs> okay, well, obviously the... such a favourite guest that you know we had such a good time doing it the first time. We had a great time. So doing... much gold in the bank. <laughs> We're going to save that for the greatest hits release when we get to like the well, ninth or tenth interview. We'll come back and we'll do all the you know the yeah. unedited you know fortieth birthday anniversary edition. We had such a good time last time that uh, that it actually was completely unusable because it was just you and me just talking shit, uh, it, not even considering the microphones. We kind of like you know dove beyond humour into. Pain and suffering a little bit too often. Oh, yeah. No, we'll, yeah. we'll be delving into that again tonight. Don't Excellent. you worry. I've been looking forward to it. And we're just down the road, so close. And yeah. I didn't fall over this time. Um, Got to go upstairs. Wasn't allowed to go on the balcony. That's great. We don't need to talk about it. It's all good. <laughs> great house. No, it was enjoyable. I thought it was going to be weird. Sydenham, Redfern, Town Hall, J- 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 James. You are the singer and guitarist of Light Entertainment. Uh, I'm in Wawa Wow. We played together for the first time maybe six months ago. You guys needed a support. The guy that booked us uh, said he knew you guys and said, because uh, I think we sent him one of our songs, we were kind of halfway through recording a song. Right. He kind of listened to it and he's like, oh, yeah, you guys you guys do kind of weird stuff. I think it'd work with these guys. I'll, I'll put you in contact with them if you need a band to play with me. Like, 
Yeah, because we don't know anyone. Uh, <laughs> That's sweet because we are in the same boat. Generally. But it was good, but that, then we ended up getting on really well because we were yeah we were really new. We were like all of us had like not been in bands or played in anything in years, and we were just kind of like, what do we what do we do? And we is, were isn't, isn't that lost. like a weird, bizarre process? I find when because I was never in the loop. I've always been just like, how do bands get big anyway? How do bands? There are these bands that release stuff and they do things. They're just better. When I saw you guys, I was like, holy fucking shit, what is this? And then uh, Paul, our guitar player at the time, was just like, apparently they've recorded an album. And I'm just like, what? Which I have listened to the shit out of, by the way. Um, it's fucking killer. Like, it's... Oh, thank you. The thing that, that sort of struck me is that we have... I guess we're, we're kind of similar philosoph- music philosophy-wise, but we're not necessarily similar sound-wise. We're kind of silly and stupid. <laughs> You guys are, are brooding. But the same intensity applies, I think. I wouldn't say you guys are silly and stupid at all. Uh, we got a silly, yeah, stupid it's, nature it's, to us. It's cheeky, but it's very serious music. Oh, yeah, well, we, we take, obviously, the music that's seriously. That's, that's, like, and that's what it's all, yeah. I think it's kind of funny in a way. Like, it's, I don't know, you can almost make light of it because it is... So silly. Like, it's 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 so funny how emotional people get in all of these situations that you kind of have to parody it. It's pretty hot up here on the stage tonight for the hives. It's like putting a polar bear in a desert. We are so cool now that we could freeze this desert. And... And freeze to... 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 It, that's true. You have to you have to understand how ridiculous the entire situation is. I mean, yeah. even getting up on stage and playing instruments for people just seems like an incredibly old. It seems like something that people just did in the nineteenth century. Like like, hey, look at me! I'm going to fucking play you a song, make your noises with the machine. It's ridiculous that it happens in the first place. Like you almost have to put on a character because if you are that person getting up on stage, it's like you'd be like, why the like why the fuck are you doing this? Are you ready to die and become that? What, yeah. Like, what are you setting out to achieve? Yeah. But I don't know. It's something you just didn't, um, you just kind of enjoy doing, but you do, it, like, I don't know, at least in our case, we do it so reserved, which is why everything we do sounds kind of sarcastic and uncomfortable because it's just kind of like, ha ha, this is a fucking joke, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. Isn't it? This is hilarious. Do you see the irony? Like, yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean, but for us, it's like he, we don't have the voice of going, this is a joke, ha, ha, ha. We have, hey, you know, look, isn't this silly? It's a bit of a laugh, isn't it? You know, whoa, well, wow, it's all a bit of a joke. You know, it's just cost me like a lot of income and a lot of time over the years to kind of take it over my life and I don't get any reward from it. It's just a joke. It's a bit of a laugh, you know? It's just fucking funny. <laughs> Yeah, it's that ever-evolving joke. Like, it becomes yeah. a joke about a joke. Like, I suppose that's the concept of uh, you, you develop with your band is this, like, that's why the whole notion of bands become so close and develop all these weird in-jokes is because you spend so much fucking weird time at yeah. weird hours in weird fucking places with these people. Like, mm. we're, you're sitting in, like, a warehouse in Botany Docklands mm. where there's a huge industrial power plant just spewing out chemicals and some, like, 55-year-old swing a couple living across the road. Mm. Just, like, play, like standing there with your instruments at, like, 2 a.m. in the morning surrounded, like, the, the car park next to us is where all of those... Uh, Double decker Sydney tour through King's Cross down to Bondi red buses with it with no roof. Yeah. You sit on them, it's the car park for them. Oh shit. So you go there and like you go into practice and there's nothing there and you come out and there's just like 30 of these buses just parked there in suns and like security guards walking around making sure no one's breaking in to steal the buses. <laughs> My only social circle, pretty much apart from two people is the people that I've been in a band with. Like, it's weird because it's just kind of my, my life for a lot of... Maybe play it without buzz. Yeah. Whenever I have guests from bands on the show, which are always local bands because I don't know any fucking other bands. Um, Everyone's in a local band, though. What do you mean? Every, no, we were just talking about this because everyone you know is in a local band. Because no, but everybody is in a band that is local to somewhere. Oh, fuck off. Playing with accents is a great way to exercise your voice and speech. Now, the key to any accent is to isolate the sounds that are specific to that accent. 
So let's start with the German W and V sound. There's no difference between them. They both sound like a V. Mm. So let's listen to this. Vi is the voice like Vine. With an English accent, that's how Y is the voice like Y. Vi is the voice like I need these big beds. Thank you so much for I need these big beds. And now in German, I need this big Bits. And I put on the accent. The accent. That seems to help when I do it. I don't know why. So they get the best get the suitable best sound suitable from their native, native language. language. So, so try something like this. this, 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 this. There's a great quote from Robert Fripp about when David Bowie called him up to come over to essentially Berlin and record guitar for Heroes. And uh, Robert's like, you know, yeah, David called me up and he's like, yeah, come here. It was Brian Eno calling from Berlin. He said, hang on, I'm here with David Bowie. I'll pass you over. Hi, I'm Robert Fripp of King Crimson. Yes, he did. Jimi Hendrix did shake my left hand. And then he puts his phone down, he looks at the camera and he's an old guy when he's saying this. He's got his mon- He's got a monocle. And like, right. Yeah, he's like a... A dapper gentleman, Robert Fripp, even though he's absolutely He did insane. the guitar for, for Heroes. He, a lot of the, well, not all of the guitar, but he came on and played like lead guitar. Because like I know the guitar line from Heroes the is the Heroes sustain. Heroes line, that's him. Yeah. It was all feedback was at the feedback right. It was feedback measured at the right parts of the studio. <laughs> that's amazing. But anyway, sorry, um, what was the quote? And he's like, yeah, he's like, David asked me to come play some hairy rock and roll guitar. You know the thing about hairy rock and roll guitar? You just might get fucked. And he's like, <laughs> he's like this like seventy year old man, and he's got his he's got his monocle, and he's just kind of sitting there, and you're just like, fuck, yeah, what a badass! <laughs> like, it's like it's just one of these ones that yeah, it, no, it's just so ridiculous. We are the Goon Squad, and we're coming to town. We are the Goon Squad, and we're coming to town. Beep. Beep. It's like Charlie Watts has that presence as well. Like mm. they're just proper English gentlemen. You're like what statesman? You can be a statesman yeah. of music. Yeah. I suppose Tom Waits is that certain mm. like they are just like a statesman of music. Yeah, and it's kind of like that sort of character. There's like, it, you have to have achieved a lot to be able to reach that level and pull it off. And he's just one of those guys. Are you evolving in the direction that you anticipated in 1974? I didn't have anticipations. I didn't really have expectations. I had no idea what I would do. Hmm. Honestly, you guys are my favourite local band. It's something really different, and uh, I'm really almost proud of the fact that Sydney could come up with something like you guys. Like, it, it extends beyond just simply loving you guys as a band and, like, I'm so glad that there's something like this around. Did you like that wall of compliments there? Yeah, I didn't know it went to interject. You guys are like a weird orchestra of ridiculous instruments. You just said Henry was on the it's, mandolin. We've been joking about this a lot lately. It's kind of like the, uh, like it's embarrassing, but that, that that Dewey Cox movie, the bit where he's in the War, cinema. Card. There's this one scene and he's in there and it's just got every instrument and it's like he's trying to get like a goat to sing and it's just like. Yeah, even even the goat was perfect. Yeah, the goat was good. Yeah. Were the strings tangy enough? Oh, they were tangy. They were very tangy. Tangy. Unbelievably tangy. No, guys, the strings were not tangy. They're salty. You kind of have to step back and you're like, this is so fucking silly. This is like, like <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. how are we going to get timpani, guys? We need to. <laughs> it's yeah, it's like, exactly. Well, you guys are like that. You guys are trying to add as much as possible. I mean, like, uh, sorry, that sounded really mean. Uh, no, uh, but it's, that's what it is. Like, for us, we all survive in other ways. This is pure fun for us. Like, we don't really have ambitions for it beyond satisfying our in- indulgence. Yeah. So we kind of indulge in indulgence. For 
us, it's like, fuck, we suck at putting records out. We're not good at it. Like, ultimately, you re- at the end of the put day. One, you're, you're recording another one now and you release one six But, like, ago. releasing it and stuff, like, it's not it's not about, like, releasing Like, we kind of did it and we were like, cool, that was fun. Like, we learned a lot. Let's try and do something better. Like, it's more, it's more fun just to kind of, like, play and record. And I think that's where we kind of recognize that we really enjoy it. All right, Fred, back off the goat on a second pre-chorus. I want to hear his heart, not his soul. Right, not so much in the release of stuff. No, I like it's more, it's, it's just like, it's fun to, you know, muck about in the studio and do things that are a bit silly. I, I agree weird. with you on that. I really hate releasing stuff. The PR and side of stuff is, is, is awful. Yeah, and like, li- and like, I don't know, like live as well. Like, it's just... Live is a lot of work. It's, yeah, it's like, don't get me wrong, like, it's cool, but any day of the week I would rather be at home writing something like it's I don't know you, you know what I mean like it's just oh, it's, it's more fun creating something whereas out there you're exerting something and it's like mm. it's so much more nothing to bring something in than give something like you know that's what mm. it is like you create something you make something in a studio and yeah. you give it you're all on the stage like you make it and then you give it away it's like fuck it I want to make I, it for I, my fucking self sure but it is very nice to, to, no to show people what you've been working on all at once and well go, yeah totally. this is us which is why the release policy for our album is either you can come to a gig and buy it or you can come over to my house you're just going to sit there and we're going to look at each other really quietly and intensely while I play my music at an uncomfortable volume that's the deluxe experience if you want to buy the album you pay an extra 20 bucks for that and I'll come deliver it myself and I'll it's force the, the uncomfortable on amount of drugs camp. on you is, yeah if you is, buy is that the, is the house come uh, to my I'll drive you to my house and we'll just kind of quip and every time you like say something it, it's, we're, we're going to misunderstand one another yeah yeah, yeah. the conversation won't have any flow and you won't be you won't be allowed to move <laughs> And no eye contact, actually. No eye contact. Wait, is, is it no eye contact for the person who bought it, who comes over to your for house? But you, you Don't make eye contact with me. But you, from, I'll pick you up. No eye contact. No <laughs> eye contact. Get to my house. Eye contact. Music. Music off no eye contact. <laughs> They're the two ways you can experience the, the album. Sign me up. Yeah, but really it's only vinyl, right? Yeah, yeah. And Final with the, an album plus, code. Plus the experience, yeah. <laughs> you, 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 you. Oh, dude, I had you, this fucking you. fuck out moment at work yesterday. What? Oh, I'd like not work yesterday, but like a, a th- last week, Friday last week, is that there was this woman that had joined uh, the creative team as one of the copywriters. Okay. And um, her name was Yu. Like her name, she was Chinese name was Yu Ling. <laughs> so but she I, was you. But I didn't, in many ways, I didn't meet her. Y- you was her. But I didn't meet her. So you didn't know who you was. I, I didn't, yeah. <laughs> I, but I'd never met her. Like I'd been out of the you office. never met you. Yeah. I'd been out of the office and I came up and like one of the girls asked me for advice and I was like, who wrote it? She's like, you did. And I was like, I fucking didn't write it. And she's like, no, you did. Like, did I fucking do this work? Is there something that I did at work and I just totally forgot about it? No, I, I, I fucking didn't write this. Who did it? She's like, you did. And she's like, you did. <laughs> you did. And everyone was looking at me because every like there were like four other people standing around and they knew who you was. <laughs> and so they were all like, James, you did it. Like, why don't you know? And I was like, what the fuck? And I was like, you did this. You did this. No, 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 no. Not, not you, but you did this. Nerve damage. But that happens to a lot of drummers. I'm pretty sure it's repairable, isn't it, though? Like, you just got to rest it up for a bit. Well, Phil Collins had that, and he's coming back. That's true. You can't kill him. You can't kill Phil. Volume one. Challenge accepted. You know, I remember the first time I heard your name, you were the, you were the drummer from Genesis, and then you made the transition yes. to the lead singer. And I was curious if that's something that, had you been the whole time you were drumming, frustrated, thinking, I want to get out there up front, I want to sing? No, no, no. Hmm. As many of you can see, the road ahead is filled with <laughs> It's not nuclear bombs we must fear, but the human mind itself, or lack of it, on this planet. Let's talk about your day job. You're working, you know, I say you're working at Light Entertainment because you fucking do. Like, you have to do shit tons of work for that band. I know you organise a lot of stuff. R- right? That's correct. That is, yeah. That's yeah. somewhat correct. I'm like, yeah, that's true, yeah. Am I wrong? Yes. Am I wrong? <laughs> yes. Uh, but you also have a full-time job yeah, on top of that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in which you are in marketing? Yeah, I work in uh, the marketing department. By the way, if anyone here is in advertising or marketing, kill yourself. I would not expect you to be in marketing. A large, well, a vaguely large company. 
are you freelancing for them or are you contracted or are you I'm full time? Full time, permanent full time. Full-time. This company, yeah, at the moment. Does that affect anything about your uh, time priorities? Uh, I don't think so. I think we're still pretty diligent with like um, yeah. everything else. Like, I think I mean, you can be pretty diligent full time. I, I do. I do work long hours. I work like eight thirty to six thirty most days. Right. Um, well, I do a lot of like it's not that long. I do like other longer hours, but like I try and we try and do three practices a week. Shit, um, that's crazy. You're just fucking exhausted. Like, <laughs> yeah. I'll work, finish, get home, go to rehearsal and get home at 2 a.m., get up at yeah. 7 again to do it all over again. You do it, That's your week. And then yeah. you kill your weekends. Yeah, the weekends are a ride out. Like you just hear about the whole things like politics in a workplace. You know, you always hear about it when you're like younger. Like you kind of think it's this weird concept and then you get there and you realise it's like it's just, it's just fucking weird. It makes no sense. You're like, surely that's not a thing. Like, yeah, really, yeah, it's just, just like, one of those common as if tropes. People, as if people could be really that... that that fucking rude. Yeah. And, and then they you get fucking there, are. And people are just massive cunts. Yeah. Like, they, seriously, <laughs> you have people that lie, people that steal, like... The lies. Uh, I've, I've the had lies that. I worked insane. at, I worked like, at uh, a large uh, financial firm. The lies that lies, were around me. Lies. That's all we get from those who pretend to know but don't. Some people are really hateful as well. What's well, the thing? It's climbing, it's climbing the political ladder because as soon as you become decent at something, people are like... Like you become a competition to someone or something for like that. Like it's it's such yeah. a weird environment, and you're kind of thinking how fucking poorly evolved are humans. They're like, do you not understand that if we just work as a team, we can get the job done quicker? Everyone will still recognize that we're all doing the work, and everyone gets paid more money and gets to go home earlier. Yeah. Like if you if you work together, that is the end goal. Like, mm. but if you bitch around. It just means that everyone fucking sucks. Everything you do is subpar and everything just becomes gritty and you have to fight. And it's like, I get that you're probably an intelligent person, but your emotional intelligence and your cultural intelligence is that of a <laughs> Is this where we cut into my <laughs> by Devo? <Yeah>. Absolutely. <laughs> do you like that song? Yeah, I fucking love that shit. <laughs> <laughs> my I want do, it, do, like, do, 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 do. It's pretty offensive nowadays now, though. Oh, you are not allowed to say m No. I have gotten in trouble for saying that. Do I have to bleep this? I don't even know. <laughs> yeah, you absolutely have to bleep. <laughs> so it's just going to be um, bleep by Devo? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that could definitely be a name of one of their tunes, though. M what? Bleep. bleep. Devo bleep. From 1973. Yeah, yeah, even an album title. Yeah, one of their album titles was, Oh no, it's Devo. <laughs> <laughs> they included the comma. <laughs> How did the uh, single launch go? Yeah, it was fun. It was uh, pretty, pretty anxious. Yeah. yeah well, I guess I had, it was a lot of pressure, wasn't I, it? I mean, well, we felt the same about our single launch. Yeah, I don't know. I just had like a full on week, and I had like a like I kind of um, I had like an anxiety attack before. <laughs> uh, uh, after, afterwards, night. afterwards, like we finished play. I was fine before we played, but like afterwards, I just got outside and I just kind of like I felt really uncomfortable, and I kind of like. So you had a panic attack. Yeah, I had to kind yeah. of like leave after we finished. So. Right. So I don't think, it, for me, it didn't go very well. Yeah, we were very, we were very lucky. And Cam came along, and he was going to do a DJ set. We were going to get time, but Cameron Menigoni from Two SCR, the band the, next door, uh, the legend, the man, the myth himself. Hello, hello, good evening, and welcome. This is the band next door here on Two SCR. He is a absolute encyclopedia of Australian. Independent music. His show, it's fuck, 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 phenomenal. Like, cool. Cool. I say, kind of very creepy. Uh, stuff there. My name is Cameron. My name is Cameron. Name is Cameron. 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 Name is What's Cameron. so fascinating is 20, 30 years from now, there's so many bands that will have nothing really written about them that have hmm. made a few tiny EPs and records and you know, they'll have split up, move through the country. People won't know who they are, but he'll be the bearer of this. And that's like when you hear about these kind of crazy bands like Slint, Spiderland or whatever, or even, you know, the classic example like, you know, the Velvet Underground, you know. Yeah. He is the bearer of that knowledge. Like just by the volume of music he goes through, like 80 new artists a month. It's fucking crazy. The fuck. Every episode, every song, 
it's male vocalist, female vocalist, male vocalist, female vocalist. I think what's the cool is that's like there's so many bands out there with female singers that are great. It's just that they don't get the mass attention from like mm. the public. Like and like there are a lot of bands because like you know it's you know and like you know this everyone likes music. It's yeah, new bands, and I think the big problem is like not the, the, the yeah. It's just that like you know he's actually using platform. I'm not good at talking about this, and whatever I say, I'm going to sound blundered. Sweet. James, you are in the middle of recording Light Entertainment's second album. You came straight from the studio, I believe. Yes, to yes, we did today. Yes. Or how, how is Look, it going? It's been going very successful so far. We've smashed through quite a lot of stuff. Um, it's an eight-track record, and we've kind of done drums for five of them, as well as a lot of, uh, you know, started getting some beds and ideas down. Today wasn't a very successful day, but the other days have been successful. We'll get the bones or the structure of a song down or the concept. We'll lay down the drums mm-hmm. and then essentially pull everything back to nothing, have a go and see what we can come up with and reconstruct it and arrange it. Especially because, yeah, we're, this one's um, quite different and using a lot of instruments we haven't really used before. Right. Well, what, what kind of stuff are you using? Quite a bit of 12-string guitar, some mandolins, and a lot of sequences and synthesizers, a lot of analog synths. You know you know my thoughts on analog. I just love synth in everything. There's a lot of synth on this record because recently I um I purchased a Korg MS20 and okay. a like semi-modular synthesizer and um and so essentially <laughs> we've been doing that and like work about the vocals are going to sit on top of it, but it's just like it's a very so different is the synth doing the bass line for on some a of few them? on a few songs. And it's kind of like two sides. So first half of the record kind of takes us from where we sound kind of now and moves us towards this new sound. And then the second half is essentially um, industrial gospel music. (laughs) I wouldn't expect it. How long have you been recording the album? Four weeks or so. Like we've done bits and bobs so four or five every se- weekend. Five sessions. Yeah, I've done like the last three or four weekends. A whole weekend. Yeah, like a Monday, Tuesday. I mean, not a Monday, Tuesday. Yeah, like a Saturday, Sunday. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what? Um, holiday. Holiday. You're time. in. You're in holiday mode. Okay. <laughs> All right, uh, Jane. Actually, I'm going to get myself another beer. Let me. Let me. Oh, can you grab me a uh, a cheap rivet? Twenty five dollars a case. Oh, thank you. You opened it for me. And you threw it in the air and shook it up for me before you opened it. Thank you. Uh, this is the worst beer in the world, by the way. How uh, I wanted to know what uh, you're struggling. <laughs> you because know. I got it up for you? Yeah, no, I, I'm, I do I'm your thankful. service. Uh, I give you a beer. I didn't say it was the worst delivery of a beer. I mean, it might, have been, it it might be your beer, beer but it, oh, oh, round two. Yeah. yeah. That's a tall house, man. Shit's going to fall. 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 I think that's kind of interesting that you guys are actually writing it as you're in the studio. I mean, that's for us, we try massively not to spend anything until we absolutely have to. So everything yeah. is completely done by the time we record it. Like for us, it's somewhat the same. We only record exactly what we know we're going to record. We just don't know what's coming after it. Yeah. So we'll go in and we'll be like, this weekend we're tracking the drum part for this, the drum part for that, the drum part for this. We go in and we're like, bam, we know what to do. It's like this weekend we're going to go in and we're going to do the outro synthesizer in a Mellotron. And we'll be like, cool, I know what the parts are going to be. I at least know what the atmosphere of the part's going to be. Like, I kind of know this is going to be a lead that probably incorporates this melody and has this kind of vibe. I'm going to do it. I'm going to layer as much of it down as I can. Yeah. And then I'll go away and during the week I can edit that into a shape that I see fit. And then I can come back and go, okay, cool, now I've edited that into a shape I see fit. I can take this guitar part and I can write that in. Cool. I'm going to go put that in and essentially build it like a like a like a jigsaw puzzle like so go in there and throw as much as you can at it so we're not still like in saying like in saying that we've got managed to get like we've got a lot of content down we just haven't done any editing yet so we'll throw a heap of stuff against the wall and then see what sticks yeah i I think that's the best way to do it so i don't think anything is a lost time like we'll try and at least record guitars for half the album in one day Mm. and so we'll do like a 9 a.m till 5 a.m session and we'll just kind of... Shit! Like, we'll just kind You're of... You're able to stay there that late? 
Uh, well, yeah, because we've been working with Fan a long time. So right, okay. We like he's got he's what, what's it? Sorry, who's who's who's? Is, would you say he's producing it? Is yeah, he, Fan's Fan's is engineering a producer and yeah. as well as an engineer. Okay, like, well, what's his still sorry? Very, what's very his full name? Nathaniel Sharif, but he goes by the name Fan, and he is uh, one of a kind. He, one of a kind. He's, uh, he's great. He helped us out with the first one, and he's so good, so good to us. And like big oh, shout out to Fan. Big shout out to Nathaniel. Um, yeah, no, because it's cool. Yeah, and we've kind of like you know, like today, for example, like put up with shit. <laughs> like it was yeah, a, yeah, yeah. It was a pretty shit day today, and it was just like a lot of it was down to my negativity. You know, and you can just like oh god, I hate recording. I hate it. I, 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 I know. I, I, see, it's my favorite thing. But what? someday, I love recording. I love writing and recording. That's my favorite bit. Right. Like I'm playing live. Nah. But um, <laughs> okay. But it's just when you go in and you know when you, it's, I suppose it's like doing anything and you're just trying to like you. Sometimes there's so much pressure on something that it be, doesn't become enjoyable. Yeah, I think, I suppose it's quite similar to like, um, like an egg in a spoon race or something as small <laughs> like that. <laughs> and, you're yeah. trying, and you're trying to run and you're like, you're going so slowly and you know if you go any faster, you're going to fuck yourself up and you try and do it and then you ruin it and it's just mm. like you keep tripping up on yourself and you know that it's on you and that just works you up more okay. and you just get into such a negative headspace where nothing, even, nothing's going to sound good to you. You're not going to enjoy anything. Right. You're going to hate, like it, even the recordings that you got, you're going to be like, this is a fucking waste. So yeah, you yeah. just got to keep, sorry, this is dumb. No, no. But it's, it's like, perfect. yeah, it's just, you know, you got to, it's like, it's such a mentality thing going into the studio. Like yeah. You've really got to get in the creative headspace. And if you're in the headspace, you can like come up with things that you never would have come up. Like getting a group of people in the room and under that pressure, you can come up with really exciting things. Yeah. But you can also, you know. Add, the, the worst part great, of the creative stuff is that is that you don't, you never know if it's going to happen, when it's going to happen. Yeah. It's just, you can't control that. You can you can certainly create you, scenarios you can where you train yourself to get into totally. Spots. You can, you but sort of, ultimately, it's not like filling up a spreadsheet with data. You yeah. know, you've, it's, it's there's a subjectivity to it, and and, and you, yeah, totally can't totally. rely on. And I, I suppose, I suppose where the dedication comes and where you find these musicians doing much is the diligence. Mm. I think like you don't have like as long as long as you're super diligent. That's all that you can ask of yourself. Like, mm. obviously, you've got to push it, but if you do your best to set up those environments, you do your best to concentrate and focus on it. You do, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. you do your homework beforehand. Like, practicing being creative isn't necessarily enough. Practicing the diligence of being creative is more important. I fucking love that. What is that? That's my guitar. That was brilliant. How the fuck did you get that combination? Yeah, so it's a, re a reverb pedal. And so I recorded individual notes. Like I layered it. I did four recordings of it. So I layered a low one, a mid one, a high one, and then one picking behind the guy going like... <laughs> and, then, awesome. and then what I did is I took that and I made sure I tracked it with the, found the right amount of reverb. And then I deleted the front half and played just the reverb. And then I pushed the reverb and then reversed it. Anyway, in the end, it sounds like this. Music's the only thing I can actually kind of talk about. Yeah, I'm the I'm the same. I'm it's, so it's really terrible. Awkward, like, I, I I struggle. I would struggle to have a guest on that I could not talk about music with. Kind of has to be in there. Everything else just reverts back to like anxiety. <laughs> yeah, anxiety and music. It's like my two favorites. I, I hear you loud and clear. Let's go into this. Oh, it, it always goes into this. <laughs> Once this is a song one one point seven. It was accidental, but then after that, which I song was it? Was it? Uh, I don't feel like this in my oh yeah, I it, love that, yeah. Uh, those digital drums. They're fucking great. That song's. 
phenomenal. No, it's it, it's if the Bee Gees and Daft Punk did a, like a crossover tune, it would come out sounding like that. Yeah, uh, there's a kind of filthiness to the Scissor Sisters that I think is. Uh, that's that's all Elton John. Baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That Take Your Mama song, which was the first single I think that they had off the first album. I remember just listening to it and just going, "This is totally Elton John. This is like exactly." Well, but wasn't I? Well, my Aruha, my girlfriend, she says that it's a um, that he's a co-writer and co-wrote a lot of their material for them on the fucking Sister Sisters albums. Mm-hmm. Right, might not be true. Okay. Probably true. I Don't Feel Like Dancing was written by Jason Sellers, Scott Hoffman, and Elton John. Elton John is not listed as co-writer on any other songs by the Scissor Sisters. He, oh, he's had enough of the headphones. As soon as you get the levels right, you should totally take your headphones off. No, I think I will. Uh, I'd need to have them on about half the time, though, just so that um, I can check you everything. You can make the person feel just that the right amount of uncomfortable. <laughs> You, so you had, the, you had the British music growing up. What kind of, what was this first stuff, American stuff that you listened to? I had one of my favorite musicians is Scott Walker. He's American. I mean, he found fame in Britain in the 60s and has lived there his whole life, but he was born in Ohio, um, moved to LA when he was 14, and then when he was 21, he moved to the UK and he's resided in the UK ever since. But he's American. Right. I really like him. He's, he's one, one of my most favorite, favorite musicians. I, like, I don't mind people like Tom Waits, but, you know, there's definitely a limit. Holy uh, shit! I can't believe this. America has so much music. Um, like America has so much music. I've. It's not all about the Beatles, James. Jeez, I'm so sorry. <laughs> right. I no, I've listened to my fair share, and I still listen to a lot of American music. But the, by and large, the largest share of music that I listen to is primarily from UK or Europe. <laughs> When you look at a band and you listen to their music, you can't help but consider their, you know, their social context, their political context, their, you know, physical context, where they were, whether they're in a city or, you know, park, what sort of social climate they're living in, their, you know, socioeconomic, like demographic, like what were all of the essence and elements that came together to make that piece of music happen. So also it, it's not just about the context that you've heard it, it's about the context that the band is from and the context yeah, that they were within. Totally. Yeah, I, I think that you cannot help but factor that in. Uh, I love music I, with a story. There's such a class divide in Britain. I mean, there obviously is in America as well, but I think yeah, but you get it that. Isn't so, uh, it isn't so eloquently intertwined. Yeah, in the actual mannerisms of the people. Mm. Like you still get common mannerisms across America. I mean, I'm fucking generalising like a motherfucker here. Yeah. But... Um, you know, but in terms of like the cultural stereotypes that people have, like yeah, yeah, exactly. Like obviously, there's that kind of more working class Britain that you get on that, and yeah, it is this kind of like it's just like a way, yeah, like it's just filthier. But then, like you, you have, you, I think for a lot of like you know upper class, like you really have to work for your laugh, or you really have to work for your acclaim in a re- in British music. Like it is more about the the conceptual framework behind it. It is more about developing that idea. And same with parts of Europe. Like, it's more about, I mean, I, it obviously took a huge fall in the 90s when, um, you know, bands like Oasis and Blur came out, which are not saying they're not creative, but obviously, like, yeah. headlines and, you know, Oh, well, tabloids, like, like oh, there was the American style excess. Yeah, and, like, saying? tabloids took over into the mainstream. But yeah, prior but, to that... Oh, that, come on, what about the Beatles? <laughs> yeah, and the Beatles as well, but, like, that was Beatlemania going to America. Do you know what I mean? That was when it became sure. monstrous. Yeah, But I'm talking that. about, like magazines were quite well, a little more critical now. Well, nearly as big in America as they were in Britain. Mm, that's they what I meant, like, yeah. in the 90s. You yeah, got yeah then in, they got, then they had it, the... You know, and you get that with, I suppose, like, Damon and Justine Frischman as well, like, the idea of, like, you know, the the first couple of Britpop and all that kind of thing. Like, it was commercialization mm. of pop music again. Right. That Americans done for such a long time, but in, like, underground... Is it, sorry, who was... Was that Damon Albarn or whatever? Damon Albarn and Justine Frischman, so the singer of... Um, Elastica and Blur, and she before that was yeah. with the singer from Suede, Brad Anderson. Gossip. Oh, uh, scandalous. Mm, what's going on there? Um, Who's it ended up being a lot of amyl nitrate. That's what was going on, and that's why, Does that that's mean why like Suede, a, Suede struggled. Yeah, what's, what's the drug that, that makes your anus be up? And now... In stereo. 
What the fuck am I talking about? Uh, You're talking about uh, why you got into music and then how you got into music. You didn't feel the sense of community or engagement but you or said, yes, but socializing. You, you said when you, you got back it was, into it. You thought I, it was going to happen. But you said when you got back into it. Like you it's realize new... it's, it's cold. It's hard. Cold. It's a cold world. It makes you feel, makes you feel sad. It makes you feel insecure. And mm. you, you see that reflected in a lot of the other bands around. A few times I've heard you refer to people as jocks. Jocks. Like, I feel it all the time. Like, I, I get it. I think it's just one of the, one of the boys. You know what I mean? Yeah, and you I know, hate that, and it's so the boys. everywhere. The boys. The boys this weekend, and it's like, oh, God, this this weird... Uh, uh, well, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's just it's like... like a, it's, it's just kind of You like get a, it so much in the fucking independent Sydney music scene. Oh, My yeah. My fucking yeah. God. Like, it's the celebration of dead brain cells. Do you know what I mean? It's just the it's the homage to fuckwittery. For me, the, the difference is it has to be eccentric dumb. Like, I like some ludicrously simple shit. But here's the thing. I was... And so do I. Yeah, but I don't like the Ramones. But they are absolutely respected as, you know, a, a, a hallmark of rock history. And they're in that kind of simple, stupid... Uh, yeah, I love the Ramones. ...vein. I love the Jesus and Mary chain. Well, why the fuck... I want to be sedated. How is that different to to anything else that's sort of simple that's going on at the moment? Like, I think, A, initially it's song structure. Like, again, you look at what the Ramones were doing and it was a combination of this kind of bubblegum pop and they were kind of dragging it through this abrasive ideal and it was kind of this like really twisted concept and you got that in a lot of their lyrics like Rockaway Beach which kind of like it's like a bubblegum pop song about the beach but it's actually you know about this place and going down there where a bunch of junkies mug everyone And it's like, <laughs> yeah. but it's this kind of ironic posturing the way it, it goes. And it fucking rocks. Like, it's got balls. Like, the guitar tone is fat. Like, it's just straight ahead drums. And it was like, whoa, this hasn't been heard before. And the way that fractures through music is super cool. And it's because they take these ideas of, like, you know, the contrast or the juxtaposition yeah. of those tones, which is what you do, which is what we do. Like, it's, okay. you know, juxt- the idea of juxtaposing these ideals of yeah, the yeah. silly and the serious, the heavy yeah. and the soft. And what's coming through today is they're going like, I strum a few fucking chords, I rip like 27 billies, I've got a song about 27 billies and two chords. Again, it's an intent thing. There's no conceptual thought behind a lot of what is coming through today. The funny thing is I also share that a loathe of jaw. A loathe of, uh, uh, what's the word, like uh, fraternity culture. Yeah. Um, a loathe of, of, yeah. of the, of the like year, col- the you boys. You have a colony of ants. And not even and like... A murder I'm... of magpies and a loathe of jocks. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, it's not even... that loathe of jocks. <laughs> I don't know. I was just, I've never been able to be part of those groups. But you know Almost Famous? No. Like, I know the film, I haven't seen it. You have not seen the film? Okay, I, so I did you know Lester Banks? Like, I, Lester Banks, yeah, the yeah, journalist. Yeah, 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 I know of, of the name. He was played by the late Philip Seymour Hoffman in the film Almost Famous. And uh, he Jokey said this... Jokey Monkey Hoffman. I love Philip Seymour Hoffman. Everything he... he and he loves... And he loves... Jo- yeah, yeah, yeah. like, I love Philip Seymour Hoffman and he loved heroin. One would say that Philip Seymour Hoffman is your heroin. In some ways, yes. Every night I've got to get a big... Gender fluidity on the show. So you and I, I think, retreated into the world of music a little bit. I think you on a different level to me. Like Lester Bangs in Almost Famous. I'm glad you were home. I'm always home. I'm on cool. Me too. The only true currency in this bankrupt world is what you share with someone else when you're uncool. I remember being called emo because I was um, into the living end. Yeah. No. Like, how fucked is that? Uh, but now music... I, yeah, I got emo a lot as well. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah. but now music, you and I are not in any sort of cool crowd or, like, we routinely have to work around not being included in things. I choose... It's, so what about jogs in the music by choice, world? It's, it's my choice. There is a jockery of the music world. Yeah, totally. I think we try and escape it as much as possible. It's it's easier for us. Just We have more fun with music when we just do it, which is why we haven't released anything. Um, 
why we gig with the bands we know and we like and like we'll just organize the gigs together like we're not very good at socializing beyond that it's it's scary yeah i i totally get what you mean yeah look i think there is a culture and it's like i'm when you come across it you're just not that interested in it it's like i'm just not yeah. having a very comfortable time life's pretty fucking short as it is anyway i'm not going to i'm not going to bother yeah. with this or with you it's so much more fun playing like a show at pirate house to 30 people for us, that's what it is. It's like we've got a bunch of cool friends that are into really cool music that play cool music, and we get to play with them. And when we want to write, we just get to write a bunch of stuff. So as far as I'm concerned, I'm I'm doing what I want to do with music. Yeah, like I get to make records. I you know get to hang out. We get to chat about music. It's nice. Yeah, I get to see. Like I'm not very good at going out. I'm always home. I'm on cool. So where did you go to uni? Uh, so I went to SCA, Sydney College of the Arts, in uh, Rizal. Yeah, sculpture, performance, and installation. Was my degree. Sculpture, performance, and installation. What's the degree? Yeah. What did that involve? Sculptures, performances. And you made sculptures. I made a few sculptures, um, and I made a couple of installations. Um, I was quite interested in like generative art. I didn't make a lot of art. I spent a lot of time thinking right. about that I should make some. Um, <laughs> That's like kind of like me now. Like I, I went to art school because I was like, oh, you're gonna meet so many musicians and I'll be able to like you know play music and stuff got there realized that oh fuck I have horrible social anxiety I'm not going to meet any of these people just kind of blundered my way through a degree and <laughs> so is that and really no one and yeah and I haven't really stayed in like I like all lovely people nothing on them but I just you kind of lost contact with pretty much well, with everyone that I went to uni you know with. when I went to uni I I had very few friends I thought that I was putting that down to the type of people that were doing the degree that I was doing I totally did as well and then you just like it's me. It's me. Yeah. Well, it's me. No matter where I go, there I am. Yeah. Isn't yeah, that funny? Yeah, like, you're like, you can't, yeah, I'll you... go somewhere else and you go somewhere else and you're like, fuck, this is... Uh... And you realise, oh, no, 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 the problem The problem is me. Uh, it's me. Yeah, it's tough. I, I, like, I feel very grateful because when after I finished uni, I met Henry and Dan and Patrick. The other members of Light Entertainment. Yeah, and our ex-lead singer who's, um, uh, yeah, she, she could have a book written about him. Um, well, you put this quote on the uh, Light Entertainment blog... Past participants in the Light Entertainment team have included Patrick, Oliver, Jake, Drew, <laughs> Steve, We're Brad, asleep. Brad, James, Jazz Hands, Salmonella, Tom, Shoda, Shoda, Little Mo with the gimpy leg, Ed, and more. All of these relationships came to a close due to a combination of misaligned values, musical aesthetic, poor temperament, addiction, prolonged periods of uncomfortable silence, or bullying veiled under the guise of friendship. Were you the bully? I was. The, I was the victim. <laughs> with my band uh, I've sort of changed my because we've been going for sort of over four years now my drumming style has changed since then I have used to be very focused on little tiny uh, sort of accents embellishments of, embellishments you know Henry style and like you know he Henry the drummer for Light Entertainment he knows what he's doing. He's an incredible drummer and he's he's got a great idea of dynamics and great skills in those areas and and I don't have you've those anymore because I stopped. Ma- well, you've mastered the Apache beat, or the Motoric beat, you know, this the kind of... The robot beat. It's well, No, but that's the thing. It's not robot. Like, it's, it's so, uh, like, intrinsically genius in its simplicity. Like, the way it feels and pulses is is a very rare thing that I have. Like, it's just perpetual. Like this, this kind of like beautiful trance-like state to it that you know a, not many people can do. You know the hypnosis of like sitting on a tr- transport. That's kind of like you're perpetually going on a journey. You can kind of see as you're sitting there. It physically encapsulates this kind of like landscape of this traveling along. And um, oh well, thank you, yeah. thank you, man. I'm a topical guy. Topical yeah. guy. Can't no, I get it. I tell it like it is. I'm like the. Uh, yeah, but you know what? I'm like the Donald Trump of light entertainment, as, as, as hard and as Henry's the Stalin. <laughs> I know you did a couple of gigs as a sort of industrial band under the t- name Light Entertainment. Yeah, we've had yeah two of the um, most painful shows of all time. <laughs> <laughs> Here is a box, a musical box, wound up and ready to play. But this box can hide a secret inside. Can you guess what is in it today? When you think about the whole difficulties of 
getting a band to go, there's so many different things against you. I mean, everyone's got something different in mind for the band and what the level of commitment is, where they want it to go. I mean, it's amazing the bands happen at all. I mean, you've gone through a whole bunch of different incarnations of light entertainment, as I said. What was it that melded this current form, of which keeps changing anyway because you keep adding members? Yeah, well, I think it's one of those things that it's like you go through enough people, you, the people that the people that want to be there and the people that are, have so, something really valuable to contribute will be there. Yeah. Like eventually you'll come through enough people. Like you, it's it's like I suppose it's like how people, you know, date or something. It's yeah. Like, that's why we've had a lot of people and like some people that are still very close to us but just totally were not the right fit. Or like certain people you come across are so cocksure in themselves and come in with such ideals and this applies to everything in life. And I think one of the big things about being in a band is being able to compromise, being able to understand where people are coming from, from a musical context. It doesn't mm. necessarily even have to be emotional context because, yeah, like, you know, we're a bunch of emotional spastics. But at the same time, <laughs> yeah. like, you you still have to understand where that person's coming from. Plus, certain people's tastes are very questionable in a very negative sense. You can like something, but you've got to understand that sometimes you, that doesn't necessarily need to be incorporated into, into the music that you make. That can be an unrelated interest, and some people just like the certain types of bands, and it's just like this band is a, a big red flag for me. Then there's also certain people that just like really like you'll play them something that's really good, and and it's not that it won't click. They'll say they get it, but it's just all the, the least impressive or illustrious elements of this piece. Not the actual acts, but the bits that, that twist your that, buttons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The bits that, yeah, the bits that turn your dials. Here's the thing about you and I. I mean, we get along pretty well. We appreciate each other's music a lot. Uh, we do have divergent tastes. and there's Yeah, because, again, I think there's certain things that we can see in, like, these, these ideas. Like, yeah, like I'm saying, we might have different interests in bands, but the things that we like about them are universal concepts. You know what really uh, really floats my boat, my musical boat, is one-offs. Something happens once in a song. I am also a very big fan of that. You guys have a couple of those. There, no, there's a lot. I was working on one today. <laughs> yeah, no, it's just, it's just a fun thing, the idea that, like, it, it exists in all forms of culture, like high and low. Like, it exists in fucking ancient art. It exists in Hollywood movies. It exists in whatever, it exists in, you know, mm. poems, it exists in memes or whatever, but the idea of blink and you miss it, you know, it really rewards rewards the person that pays attention to something, whether it is the like, you know, you go outside and, you know, go outside and smell the roses and you kind of have this idea that you really like this active engagement and um, my dear friend Patrick has a really good uh, way that he puts this together and it involves like a hip thrusting and a hand. <laughs> it's got to, you got to... You it keeps, it gets your toes a-tapping and your yeah, fingers no, a-snapping. you got to earn the right to your riff and the idea oh. that you have to, uh, yeah... You know, it's the prolongation of satisfaction ultimately makes it bigger. Yeah. Making it, yeah. again, now now it's a sexual thing. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. but it's, <laughs> that's that's true. A, but not in a negative I, sense. Like, it's something that just stems into all parts of life, and it's the way you kind of think about it in music. Uh, James Dunlop from Light Entertainment. Thank you so much for coming on again. As we said, you had already done an episode and then I... Sean, you're a gentleman and a scholar. It's always a pleasure. Um, Thank you very much. James, I have one question. We usually get our guests to end out on a song. Choose a song to fade us out, if you will. What song would you like us to fade out on tonight? I would like to fade out with the title track from a very famous Walker Brothers album. It was the last Walker Brothers album ever made. It came out in 1978, and it came at a really interesting time in the career of Scott Walker. Um, so obviously the Walker Brothers began kind of as a uh, as a band in the early 60s. They, they formed quite young, and Scott was the bass player. And, the, um, you know, they were playing some of these early LA shows, like the Whiskey A Go-Go Prize at the Doors when it was still like, you know, swinging dance groups, mm. and they thought... England, Beatles and the Rolling Stones had just cracked it. That's where we're going to go. We're going to get that big production over there. Um, so they moved over and uh, they had this one song that was getting written for them and it was a little bit too low for the singer to sing, the guitarist singer. So they said, Scott, you've got a deep voice. Why don't you sing this one? And he goes, yeah, thanks, guys. <laughs> and he sings it and it turns out he has the greatest voice of all time. It becomes a number one hit and they become huge. They have number one hits in England. Like when Jimi Hendrix first came to the UK, he supported them. Obviously by the end of the tour, it switched roles. But the fact that they were still that height that, you know, this was what was going on. 
And um, basically then in 1967, he, uh, you know, he'd become the leader of the group. He was quite famous. He had, uh, you know, he had a lot of big, a big fan following and he, he went solo and he released Scott 1, 2, 3 and 4 between 1967 and 1969. And this was these fantastic array of albums that were these baroque pop masterpieces, kind of this Phil Spector wall of sound. I'm pretty sure it was done by like the same producer who did Dusty Springfield. And it was a combination of like Jacques Brel covers and then some like, you know, traditional standards and a bunch of songs he wrote. And then the last album was this like amazing, huge thing that was all completely self-written, this amazing baroque pop, huge orchestras, like orchestral arrangements playing behind it. But the problem is, is the, the masses didn't like this and his record sales declined over the course of these four albums until he lost his contract at Scott Walker on the fourth album. And he was like, I can't do this anymore. And he retracted and retreated from the public, hid himself in his own womb and cocoon of depression <laughs> for a few years and then realized he needed to make some money. So he reformed with the Walker brothers and they did a few, you know, run of the mill, very shit average albums like they were doing before. Because this was music that your, you know, your friend's mum would listen to. Wasn't serious. My friend's Jeez. mum. Your friend's mum. That's an odd. To. Okay, yeah. And 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 essentially, they were kind of running low on the record label. It was like guys, you know, country and covers, and they were like, guys, we're going broke. You make one more album, then we're out. We've like the label's done, and these guys we're are done. Like, Fuck, yeah. we're washed up. This isn't going to happen. And they and then Scott goes, guys, I got a great idea. Let's just do what we want to do. Let's be true to ourselves, and, and and true to themselves is what they were, and uh, Scott, so they had four. So there's three members of the band: a guitarist, a bass bass player, and a drummer. And Scott, the bass player, he wrote, wrote the first four, and the guitarist wrote the last five, and the drummer had the middle two. You know, they're like, you know, we'll split up, we'll make it even. We're going to write the type of music we want to write. This is 1978. And Scott's obviously, you know, thinking far ahead, and he creates these kind of like futuristic, like obviously now in hindsight, not what futuristic, but basically his perception of what the future of music was. It was this kind of amazing, huge, epic new wave sound. Um, and he obviously, his first four tracks ended up being considered a completely classic and uh, kind of landmark recording of new wave and post-punk music for the era. You know, some of Brian Eno, a huge influence on like Brian Eno and David Bowie when they were coming out. It's also like, you know, I think you can see a lot of, a lot of influences in like Echo and the Bunnyman and even guys like Nick Cave um, and how it came together. And it's just a big foreshadowing of kind of the 80s, this amazing space age foresight. And uh, the track that I've selected is the third track <laughs> out of this four track EP. Uh, the, first, the first track is, um, the first track is kind of like a really kicking, a really kicking kind it's, of. It's a kicking, great, it's a great swinging. groove. The second one, the second one is. It's got a very pop to spacious. It. It's more, it's more about the atmosphere, and there's a wailing saxophone solo. And obviously, the fourth track, uh, which has a great title that I'm not going to mention because it's not the song that we've selected. It's this kind of epic, long ballad. Uh, tell us about the song that we've selected. But the song James. that I've selected, the title track of the 1978 Walker Brothers album, the last album, the album that cemented Scott Walker's place in history as an epochal figure, is called Night Flights. All right, this, thanks, for, thanks for coming on, Jay. This song, if, <laughs> if you'll let me finish, yeah. this song that I've certainly built up to, it's, it, it, it encompasses everything that is self-referential and funny about the 80s in its, in, in, its, in, its, in its introduction. It's kind of like, wow, this is going to be a greatest hit. It's a musical. There is a broad way of an introduction that comes into the song before it sits into this kind of groove and then you like it lapses back up into this new, into this new verse and it's given a, a new life by these crank and low sitting pianos. And essentially like what it's done is it's, it's, it's like it's drawn these huge spotlights like this, it's like the setting, the at the start of a musical. It's the setting, and it's a huge for opening number. Vacuum down, out to outside, plot begins. Is kind of how the intro seeps through. And this, it's this. It has this kind of like seventies drive to it, a rock thing. But these chord progression is just so long and prolonged, and it's very, it's very curious the way it pulls about. And then it kind of sinks into a chorus in such an unpredictable way that you. You, you, there's a certain minimalism to it, kind of like like Michael Roder's m melodies, and it's it's kind of you don't realize where you are until you you snapped in your court halfway through, and you're like, the beauty in how we ended up here is so unfathomably immense, but it's being conducted through like a small late seventies orchestration, and I think I think it has it's a real testament to the the emotion that he can convey in his voice and his lyrics, as well as you know just his understanding of arrangement, which which you can see even more so in his fucking like latest trilogy, obviously which took twenty years to come out, Tilt the Drift and Bish Bosh, you know nineteen ninety five, two thousand and six, and then twenty fourteen, and they're these albums that are again 
they're, they're a total new genre of music, man. Like, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's as influenced by, like, you know, Carl Stockhausen as it is by, you know, this kind of weird sun o drone metal as it is by, you know, this kind of SPK style industrial music. But it's all just done in these huge scenic tracks where his voice and his lyrics are centered and he's just paints such a picture with his vocals. They're so evocative. They're frightening. They're creepy. They're warped. They're so ugly. But sung by someone who is just has such masterful control over their voice and the plot lines in it are <laughs> okay, so fabulous. James, like, thank you so much for coming on, James. So shut the up. plot lines are, are fabulous. Like, there's a tra- Shut up! Shut up! You know what, Sean? Thanks for your time. I can see. I can see how this has gone. It's actually gone wonderfully. Let's have a listen to what was the track called? Night flights. Night flight. Night flights. Night flights. Spelt by the Scott Walker spelt, trio. Spelt by the Walker brothers. The Walker brothers. Spelt N I T E. Flights. Okay. Well, uh, thanks for coming on, James. Let's listen to no, yeah. Let's listen no, to Night Flights uh, uh, by the Scott Walker by Brothers. The Walker by the Walker Brothers. God damn it. <laughs> End bracket.